Now moving ahead, we have next session on artificial intelligence in healthcare, empowered to serve better. Artificial intelligence and machine learning solutions are transforming the way healthcare is being delivered. Artificial intelligence technologies are well suited to analyze this data and uncover patterns and insights that humans could not find on their own. With deep learning from artificial intelligence, healthcare organizations can use algorithms to make them write clinical decisions and improve the quality of the experiences they provide. So we have, we have our next speaker for the session. Dr. Anirudha Pan, founder, Deep Tech, Esquared IoT Private Limited, Algo Analytics, One Stop AI Shop, and Deep Tech Radiology. Sir has more than 19 years of experience in application of machine learning to various domains like healthcare, finance. Sir has expertise in machine learning, optimization, and control theory. And he created an algorithm for supporting vector machines to optimize the decision making. We are so we are privileged to have one more speaker for the session, Dr. Ketan Kotecha, Dean, Faculty of Engineering, Symbiosis International University, Director, Symbiosis Institute of Technology. Dr. Ketan Kotecha served as the Vice Chancellor at Parul University, Vadodara. Sir has various prestigious transnational projects under him. He is the recipient of numerous grants, including Scheme for Promotion of Academic and Research Collaboration Project, in artificial intelligence from government of India, a researcher, teacher of deep learning. We welcome the speaker to the dais. Now I request Andrew the sir to start the session. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me, uh, Dr. Kotecha. Uh, uh, so today, essentially, I will talk uh, mainly about the kind of work uh, we have done at Algo Analytics and uh, some other startups which I have been part of. Uh, so I'm not going to talk about the broad vision of you know what can be done in AI in healthcare. A lot more than what I will be presenting can be done, and I'm sure some other speaker is more uh, capable of talking about that. So um, this is again you know my opinion, but uh, I would say the decade of 2020, uh, 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 decade till 2010 was mainly about equipment, hardware, consumables, focused on historic and evidence-based care. Uh, from 2010 to 2020, you know, process automation started coming in, variables, healthcare analytics started coming into picture, uh, 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 focused on real-time out outcome-based uh, care, and then. Uh, Again, you know, this is a little bit of overlap with last decade also, but I, I would say that from 2020 to 2030, uh, more artificial intelligence, uh, uh, robotics, augmented reality, uh, focused on preventive care, all that stuff will start coming into picture much, much more. Uh, and I do believe that I think all of us are fairly young, some more than me. But uh, in our lifetime, I do think that the healthcare, I think, is going to be transformed completely as compared to what the way we see it right now. Uh, so um, why, why is this happening, right? Obviously, I mean, I think everybody knows about the computational power and the data. But I think for healthcare also now, a lot of data is getting generated. So there, are, there is a patient-generated data. There is a provider-generated data, wellness-generated data, financial data, and social data. Uh, and again, this is true for you know pretty much all domains, not necessarily only in healthcare, uh, but healthcare is sort of the new application. And uh, 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 now, since all this data actually is available, and in some cases available to be used to build models and stuff like that, uh, 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 artificial intelligence, machine learning actually has become applicable in healthcare. Again, I would say, uh, as compared to many other domains, uh, it is still a little bit difficult to get access to healthcare data for good reasons, obviously, because healthcare is a very private issue. So uh, you know, there are lots of uh, uh, laws and regulations about who can access the data and how, how you can use that data and stuff like that. And they should be there. Uh, so, but from that perspective, actually, you know, the, the pace of uh, uh, technology adoption in healthcare actually has, uh, uh, to some extent, some challenges. 
so this is something you know now coming closer to what I will be talking about. Uh, so uh, essentially, I mean the way I see it, uh, healthcare can be used for enhancing clinical productivity. Now please note, I will not say that automating clinical decisions. I mean, it is about enhancing clinical productivity because uh, at least in my opinion, uh, AI as a technology is not there to do complete automation, uh, especially in a critical area like healthcare. I mean, it is too complex, uh, the space uh, to do it. Uh, then uh, effective care delivery, uh, you know, this is something uh, uh, you know all of us know about, and you know, I mean, like it is getting applied. So some of the some of the case studies I will be presenting are in that, and then other thing where actually it can be applied a lot, and I think it will, this is this is a space where I, I think it will get adopted much faster because uh, uh, this is a space where you know i mean like things just the process of healthcare provision becoming more efficient and generally what happens is the organizations and the uh, the, the the people who are the interested parties they usually nobody has objections to uh, this stuff now enhanced clinical productivity sometimes actually uh, you know we have seen in our work that doctors sometimes are against that for whatever reason i mean like some reasons are correct reasons some reasons are incorrect reasons also but you know i mean like when when now if you are talking about uh, the decisions getting automated on the radiology images i mean obviously and the radiologist is not an ai expert so that radiologist doesn't understand that the ai is not there to replace you but to assist you so then there can be a sort of you know a, a sort of a fight against the people who need to adopt it and you know that also puts some constraints in terms of you know what uh, what adoption can happen and uh, this is where i think uh, institute like symbiosis has a lot to offer because you know uh, uh, symbiosis institute is where you know so many different departments are actually sitting in the campus next to each other and it is likely that you know i mean the symbiosis healthcare will trust the symbiosis engineering much more as compared to a random other hotel uh, not hotel hospital uh, and uh, through that actually you know close collaboration and uh, uh, sort of uh, you, you know much more uh, faster implementation of these new technologies like ai in healthcare can definitely happen and symbiosis can definitely spearhead uh, that activity uh, so this is something, uh, it's it, it sort of a, you know, it showcases the patient journey, uh, you know, so patient coming in for checking and then, you know, eventually everything happening and then patient getting discharged. And uh, what we have tried to do is we have tried to identify various places where uh, AI uh, either for diagnostic support or for uh, uh, process efficiency can be uh, uh, applied. And many of those things actually, you know, we do have some solutions which actually, you know, uh, provide uh, that as well. So, so for example, uh, you know, patient sort of, you know, comes in, right? I mean, like then speech to text technology can be used to generate an EMR. Vocal biomarkers can be used to understand if the patient actually, you know, is doing well or not. Uh, then speech to text to generate the prescription if there is a quick sort of a drug uh, uh, prescription that is uh, happening patient like if the patient needs to be admitted to the hospital then kyc id verification auto filling of the forms this can happen automatically as well uh, then you know if some kind of investigation is happening uh, you know so then there could be a medical image analytics uh, uh, if there is a lab report then you know you want to get that lab report in an electronic form uh, which can be usable so you know so that lab report data extraction can also be uh, useful over there uh, patient treatment so this is where patient journey patient knowledge graph so so essentially especially if the patient actually is coming uh, uh, multiple times to the same hospital then how the patient journey has happened through the time you know initially when the patient came for the first time what kind of diseases what kind of uh, symptoms that patient had, then you know you provided some treatment, then how that is improving, not improving. And once you are able to collect the data of many, many patients like this, right? There is a, this is a this is a knowledge gold mine, frankly, because uh, you know some of the uh, like you could create a really large knowledge graph which actually you know talks about okay what 
that, that, that patient's family, what is the family history of the patient? Then if there is a cancer history and how that cancer history actually affects something else which is not connected to cancer. And all these kinds of uh, interesting insights potentially can be gotten out of that. And again, the uh, one has to remember that like through the data, you will get some insights. But those insights have to be verified by the experts because you know the statistical methods or machine learning methods, uh, they are not intelligent, uh, intelligent by on their own. They actually will give out some of the false positive relationships also. So some, some relations which are spurious and they are just because of the statistical nature of the data. They will give those out. And that is why you know multiple relationships, when they come out of the uh, knowledge graph, I'll show a little bit about that. Uh, that needs to be confirmed by the corresponding uh, expert. Okay, okay, this does make sense. And there again, you know, multiple, uh, uh, it can go in multiple ways. So the, uh, the expert sees what the software is saying. And then the expert says, ki, oh yeah, this is obvious, you know, I already know it. Or second thing could be expert says, ki, no, this just doesn't make sense. It has no, uh, no basis in science. It is actually just a statistical uh, anomaly which is happening. Or third thing, which could be a really advancement of the, uh, of the science, is the expert says, ki, oh, you know, I didn't think about it before. But now that you know, this thing is showing this kind of correlation, actually, I think it does make sense. So, you know, so, so that is a new addition in the, uh, in, the, um, in the science or application of the science that has happened because of the data analytics. And we hope that more and more such things happen. And they can only happen if data scientists work in close collaboration with domain experts. I mean, like, you know, it cannot be one against the other, but it has to be both together. Um, so patient monitoring, patient condition monitoring, and then again, you know, there are these like a critical condition predictions or, you know, sepsis prediction algorithms which are there, and we have looked into those uh, uh, as well. Uh, again, especially in Indian hospitals and maybe outside India also, patient discharge, creating a discharge summary does usually tend to be a very strenuous process <laughs> because what happens is you are told that, okay, you can get discharge in the morning. And by the time the patient, all the processes happen, you know, I mean, it becomes the end of the day. And that is frankly a loss of revenue for the hospital also because that room gets occupied and potentially the patient is not going to pay for that particular room. So, you know, so putting a, a productive process over there is useful. And this is something which we have created. Based on the various reports that have been generated through the journey, we can create a discharge summary uh, in an automatic uh, way as well. Uh, then healthcare assistant chatbot, have you taken the medicine, have you done your exercise, you know, if not, whatever, you know, those things also can be done. And then uh, this is something not that much applicable to Indian setting, but uh, patient uh, uh, readmission prediction. So this is something which is very, very critical for uh, US hospitals because there what happens is within a certain amount of time, let's say within 60 days, if the patient gets readmitted for the same, path, uh, same thing that previously he was, he, she was discharged, uh, the insurance company doesn't pay the hospital because you know, essentially you did a wrong thing by discharging in the last time itself. So, uh, so, you know, so predicting that patient readmission you know, becomes an important uh, task. So these are various things which we have done over the years in the healthcare setting. Uh, how, how long do I have, by the way, and how, how, how long have I taken so far? 12.10. Uh, 12, and what is the time right now? Uh, I have till 12.10. Yeah. OK, that's good. So I have almost finished my presentation <laughs> now. I mean, like, <laughs> I will not talk about much of the stuff. But this is just gives you more details about the things which I talked about. You know, lab report parsing, information extraction approach. Uh, then, you know, this is something which we have created. And, you know, many times, actually, still, lot of data is in the PDF form or scanned reports and stuff like that. So uh, making that into a digital form. Uh, then medical term extraction. So this is actually the first step. This is something which we did for uh, uh, NHS hospital. And uh, Dr. Urvi Shukla actually, you know, I mean, we collaborated with her for this and the next uh, project. And she is she's with uh, your hospital. Uh, this is where uh, we are, uh, we have created a 
a system which actually tracks how the patient journey has happened over a period of time through the hospital and then actually create a more detailed database and you know what, what were the signs and symptoms at various points of time and how to use that for further decision making, decision support. Uh, I'll just skip that. Uh, or oh, 1220, okay, but still I would like to give maybe seven, eight minutes for discussions. Um, Another, again, this is not healthcare directly, but we are working with a pharma company, pharma consulting company, actually, uh, which uh, sort of monitors the social network and the news and stuff like that to understand what is being talked about a particular drug in the, uh, by influencers in the social media and things like that. So, uh, so that, that is a different type of uh, AI application, I would say. Um, Another thing, again, you know, we worked with Dr. Urvi Shukla on this is a patient conditioning prediction early warning system, uh, where, uh, you know, I think, yeah, yeah, so, uh, so, so all of us, I mean, I think people who work in ICU know that actually the news is, is one of the systems that is used to uh, decide how critical the patient is and likely to get. Uh, but but it, it does tend to give lots of false positives. I think false positives, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, so uh, the NHS hospital wanted to actually try and create some other uh, uh, machine learning based system to try and see if we can reduce those false positives. And uh, uh, with with help of uh, Dr. Urvi Shukla, we could come up some, with something which actually you know, worked a bit better than the news. Uh, uh, predicting mortality, again, this is done, I think, I believe in, this was done by one of another uh, medical consultants at Algo Analytics, uh, Dr. Sharda Bapat, uh, while she was uh, also consulting with Ruby Hall. So this is, this is with a, a Ruby Hall uh, 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 critical care uh, unit uh, data. And uh, again, the idea was there, there are these mortality prediction models like SAPS model and Apache models, and you know, we tried to create one machine learning based model also and sort of compare how it how how, how it compares with uh, those uh, traditional models icd coding assistance so uh, it's not absolutely necessary for all indian hospitals but uh, if if you if you need to now that more and more insurance coverage is increasing i mean they may ask you to do icd coding of the diseases uh, and then there is a, you can do an automated system for doing ICD predictions uh, from, the, from all the reports which are available as well. Uh, prescription compliance chatbot, I think you can imagine what, what this would be. Uh, this is something which we tried to start, but I don't think we have, uh, we, we have done much uh, on this. Uh, uh, another thing which is which could be very interesting for a large hospital like Symbiosis is you know one work which we did uh, some time back with uh, with a hospital in Texas, uh, where you know it was primarily about revenue cycle management and uh, uh, sort of you know uh, work allocations depending on various characteristics and you know which person can work better uh, in what under what conditions. Again, in the U.S., what happens is revenue and cash cash are two different things because of the insurance coverage. Uh, you, you know, once the once you discharge a patient, you book the revenue. But whether that cash comes to you or not depends on how much is the approved by the uh, insurance company. And as I think India will go to that particular uh, stage also at some point of time. So this could be of uh, interest to uh, uh, Indian hospitals as well. Um, predicting length of stay. This, uh, depending on how busy the hospital is, it could be of interest. Uh, uh, to predict, so that, that helps you to allocate uh, uh, the resources uh, depending on how long a particular patient is likely to be in a, in a critical care unit or something like that. Uh, so this is more about algo analytics, so let me, uh, yes, so uh, 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 again now, I mean last maybe three, four minutes I'm going to talk about, uh, you know, something sort of against AI and you know how we machine learning guys and data scientists are responsible for uh, something like this, right? Like you always see these kinds of things. Google, this is an old slide actually, Google DeepMind AI beats doctors in breast cancer screening uh, stuff. 
but this is all bullshit i mean like you know these are uh, i mean these are all like extremely controlled experiments with a given data set you know uh, and you know see basically data set from one hospital you train it on that hospital and you predict it on the same hospital ka data set and then you know you ask the experts to and in such controlled experiments ai really can do a better job than a human being but the reality is not controlled i mean like uh, you train a machine learning model from the images in one hospital apply it on the images on the second hospital and it will give complete rubbish results i mean it just uh, unimaginably rubbish results are uh, given out of that and data scientists machine learning guys need to understand that and sort of you know uh, work so that it is first of all it doesn't happen and secondly you know don't try and sell systems beyond what they can do so you know and this is very hard because usually data scientists are not the one who sell the system business owners though are the one who sell the system and they will sell whatever gets sold so uh, and again uh, many of us over here may have uh, followed how what happened to and this happens in a company as high profile as ibm i mean like is there watson for cancer right i mean they have completely stopped work on that particular thing because exactly the same thing happened whatever watson watson is a great system but whatever it could do they it was sold as much more than what it can do and then it back backfires and you know hospital actually then there was like couple of years back there was some hospital sued ibm and then you know all that mess sort of happened right uh so 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 we need to uh, know that uh, in my opinion uh, you know so this is actually more sensible thing uh, you know so machine learning is very strong at narrow task which of these 1000 x rays have pneumonia you know something like that if you ask a specific question to machine learning which of this has tuberculosis again you know little bit more complex but again which of this has tuberculosis or which of this has pneumonia you know i mean like machine learning will do a great job in answering that question once you actually you know feed it data from all different kinds of sources etc but if you give can you look at this x ray and tell me what might be wrong right it's extremely difficult for ai right now to actually you know do that but doctors do this day in and day out again i am not saying doctors actually are 100% correct and we have done experiments with radiologists and i'm sure you do not want to know what is the precision <laughs> that radiologists get on the you know blind uh, uh, you know uh, blind data sets but but you know at the same time you know doing a good job at a task which is completely unsupervised humans are way way better than machine learning and we have to accept that and uh, sort of you know make sure other people also accept that Uh, other things are you know i mean this is primarily a data problem but still you know these are the pathology reports and these are the radiologist reports these are the symptoms of the patient what do you think is wrong it's a, I, I, i mean today partly it is because the data re remains in silos it is not all the data is available simultaneously basically you know uh, the report taken in the same time frame for that stuff is not available but even if it was available it is not an easy job right now for the current ai technology to actually do this but doctors do this day in and day out right i mean doctors will look at how what a particular report was two months back and then based on that actually they can actually project what might be wrong uh, right now based on some other uh, report ai could never do that because doctors can think okay you know i mean like this was these were the results two months back and now maybe the condition would have deteriorated and it would have happened to this now and now this is being confirmed by uh, some radiology report or something like that and you know then adjust their diagnosis accordingly but the ai is nowhere close to doing that so uh, two takeaways from this one is that you know ai machine learning deep learning people should not sell what <laughs> what doesn't exist and secondly doctors healthcare professionals should not be worried that ai is going to replace them so you know i mean like so so if if that happens i think you know there will be more closer and fruitful collaboration uh, uh, between these two groups and that's absolutely necessary for advancement of the science so i will stop now actually i had more slides about radiology and stuff like that but you know i think that can be done at some other point of time uh, i would like to open it up for questions actually uh,
Armstrong. I'm a radiologist. <laughs> <laughs> Good, I didn't show the radiologist slides. <laughs> so. with, with real intelligence, <laughs> hopefully. Um, so, uh, I also do AI with several startups. I'm a consultant and I use AI as a daily tool for my yeah. reporting. So, fundamentally what I see is uh, the part which I don't like was the terminology. It started off with artificial intelligence. It should actually be in augmented intelligence right from the beginning. Yeah. Yes. Right? Because people started <coughs> off with that and it went into are we going to replace doctors, Absolutely. radiologists, and so on? Absolutely. So now, if I digest that term, it's very, very useful for me on a day-to-day -day basis to be more productive, to yeah. be more safer for my patients, and uh, to do 100 x-rays compared to 20 x-rays where I was doing. Right? Absolutely. I mean, actually, uh, this is exactly the business yeah. premise of a startup which I founded. So, yeah. you know, yeah. I mean, radiologists in a loop. Correct. is the only way to go for foreseeable future. Correct. So. And also, at least as of today, what you said is absolutely right. The AI cannot think still. Yeah. You know, it can still do pattern recognitions. But the thinking part, you know, no, what no, does this patient really have? What is the history? You know, that part is still we are probably a lifetime away. Maybe our next generation can take that up. Uh, uh, yeah, that, that's a very hard thing to judge. I mean, I wouldn't make that comment. But I can say this, that all AI right now is essentially, I mean, like for the technical people over here, is the same as regression. I mean, it is basically, you know, you have a data, you have an output, and it learns what kind of stuff here means this particular output. So if your data is bad, I mean, like it's not going to be able to do it. You know, so now there are, there are talks about general intelligence and all that kind of stuff happening, whether it will happen in our lifetime, 10 years, 20 years or not, I mean, I don't really know, but but it definitely needs a new scientific breakthrough for the AI to actually think. You know, right now, AI doesn't think, for sure. So no matter what what anybody else says. So, sorry, you had somebody? Yeah. One thing, uh, which I'm from Diagnostic, I'm Dr. Deshpande. Uh, basically, when we look at the AI, one thing is, Particularly in diagnostics, this term is loosely used. Let me be honest, people are confusing automation with AI. Okay, so that is not the mm -hmm. uh, thing to be used, that's what mm -hmm. I feel. And people are using it, uh, that we are using AI. Uh, people are not using AI, actually. They are using automation. Because why I'm saying this, uh, if we have to reach the stage of AI, all of our reporting uh, is right now is very heterogeneous. So, to provide data to AI software, we need to first standardize all the data, yeah. uh, standardizing the format of data. Yeah. Look, today, if symbiosis reports in some way, the other hospital or the institute reports in different way. And that is too confusing for the, I think, AI for, the, for that matter. Yeah, so, so, standardizing the data would be a first step in correct. any natural So, some of the work, I mean, I, I, sorry, I went very fast on that, but some of the work actually I presented actually talks about that. So, basically, whatever that, uh, named entity recognition kind of work, right? So what it does is like it looks at the reports and it actually identifies key uh, key things from there. So what, what pathology is presented, what medicine is presented. So, you know, first it will identify what is a pathology, what is a medicine, and then, you know, actually it will create a metadata associated with that particular document. And then that can create into a feature vector and which can be eventually used for uh, uh, machine learning. So. Yeah, and another thing is I personally don't like to use the term AI. Uh, the, in my opinion, better term is machine learning. So, machine learning, yeah, correct. So. That's it. Thanks. Any other questions? Anyone? Yes. You can shout, maybe. <laughs> so, <laughs> so uh, I think one of the aspects where this is going to be very helpful is type 1 diabetes. I think I attended a seminar in which uh, some people have totally automated insulin doses yeah. Depending on, uh, because type 2 is very, very uh, difficult to predict, but type 1 diabetes is where this machine learning is really coming up. And uh, second, on a little hilarious note, I don't think we doctors are really scared that AI is going to replace us. And I'll give you an example. I'm a gynecologist, and this Israel-based startup came to us. 
They gave us a device. They said, why don't you just try it out? And it was device to monitor the fetal heart. Hmm. And they said, what we are trying to do is we are going to give this device to the patients. And our automation will tell the patient when to come to a doctor based on the fetal heart. Mm. So the first thing I did was laugh mm. because this is not the only thing that matters. Yeah. So we are not scared, but yes, it has tremendous. I'm a very, I'm a techno, what do you call, enthusiast. Yeah. So I really like, uh, I really like to know more about uh, how it can help us. Yes, yes, so, absolutely, and I think. Uh, you know, I do feel that more uh, medical professionals, trained medical professionals actually, you know, come in AI. I think it would be very helpful for AI because the other way around is very difficult. So, uh, frankly, actually, medical professionals will find it easier to understand what AI is and, you know, sort of, you know, work with uh, data scientists rather than data scientists becoming medical professionals. So, uh, so that definitely will help. Hello, good morning. Uh, I am a basically pulmonologist and I have also completed my LLB. Now, uh, what I wanted to ask you is that I wanted to join the two branches, medical legal. Hmm. Now, my question is, you know, lots of doctors, they're having a problem with their prescriptions. They know everything, MCI guidelines are there that how a prescription should be given. But still, it's not given in that way. Hmm. So, is, it, uh, is there anything going on in that aspect? Suppose a doctor gives a prescription that prescription is being put in AI analysis. Yeah. And something is some, uh, you, we have a lot of data in the background. Yeah. And then we, uh, you know, intimate the doctor that these are the things which are to be, you know, uh, put in the prescription and some changes and how things can be like, absolutely. we give some uh, drug name augmenting. Yeah, yeah, As per the MCI guidelines, it should be amoxicillin plus clavulanic acid. Correct, correct. Now suppose that also comes as a prescription yeah. wise and then, you know, so we, that becomes easy for the doctor to correct, go ahead. Correct, correct. So we actually did create a, a prescription generation uh, tool, uh, exactly doing what you are suggesting. And it is possible to do. And I don't think technologically it is very difficult. Uh, there, there must be a few companies in India who are actually doing that uh, and, you know, some people are using it. Uh, frankly, actually, many times what happens is uh, it is extremely, one thing is technology, but other thing is commercialization. So who pays for it? I mean, you as a doctor, are you ready to pay per prescription 10 rupees extra to do it in that particular way? That is one thing. And second thing is also to use that tool you may have to change the way you do prescriptions to some extent. And that actually is extremely difficult. So, you know, changing uh, uh, habits of a person who is a successful and, you know, knowledgeable and intelligent person and you say, okay, whatever you have been doing now, you change it a little bit and do it in this particular way, it becomes very difficult to uh, adopt. So, you know, so, so that it's uh, actually... Yeah, commercialization is a very different story altogether. Yeah, you have been wanting to talk, but you are far away from the mic. So if you can shout, I, we can, I can, so. Yeah, yeah okay, somebody's coming. Thank you so very much. I'm Dr. Sachin. Thank you so very much for giving us the limitations and strengths of AI and the difference between AI, ML and various other things. It is not a question, it's more of a rhetoric. Now most of the, uh, I would use the word ML and digitization is targeted towards process improvement and efficiency optimization. Oncology was one you, you spoke about IBM Watson. I was with Manipal when we integrated that into our systems. And yes, they promised a lot, they delivered, a very, they delivered very less. Yeah. That's how it failed. Now are there any patient clinical, like patient-centered clinical outcome delivery tools which AI is working upon? Sorry, is that a question for me? Yes. <laughs> so uh, I, I'm not understanding. What do you mean by uh, clinical a outcome? Clinical outcome, a patient-centered clinical outcome tools. So, now all of this was process-oriented. Efficiency, improvement tools. No, I mean, Watson is a clinical outcome tool, right? It just didn't do a good job at it. Absolutely, yeah. So for uh, the, the no, radiology, uh, the radiology, like imaging software, which actually looks at an X-ray and says that this is wrong with that particular X-ray, is a clinical uh, outcome tool. 
So I mean, I didn't understand what exactly no, you. Any mean other, by any other, like again, from apart from hematology, like hemato oncology and uh, oncology uh, cancer, we don't find anything else. Like even with Fitbits and various other uh, variables, you have data, but you do not know what to do with the data. Yeah. So that is, I think you know, there is still a little bit of time for that. I think in next five to ten years, it will happen, because right now, if I want to actually access a lar large amount of diverse data from Fitbit and then re uh, reports and everything. As a AI company, I can't do it. Because you know the data is in silos owned by different c companies or people and you know I have no access to it. So I can't correlate, it, correlate the uh, different stuff uh, for the data. And that is where I mentioned that actually you know Symbiosis being this institute where you know everything is actually is within one microcosm. So you could actually start doing that in a much better way. So you could sort of ask patient, you could give patients Fitbit, for example, you know, while they are here. And then that Fitbit data and then their clinical reports and all that kind of stuff that can be correlated for, at least for the duration while they are uh, around here, right? So, you know, so something, again, whether this will be done, again, who will pay for it, you know, with implementation stuff is a very different thing. But in theory, all these things are possible. But they are not necessarily possible for a company like me because if I want to access, you know, data of a patient from Fitbit and at the same time, you know, what are the clinical reports of that patient, I just don't have access to that data. So, so, so you know, I can't correlate. Okay, thank yeah. you. Thank you, sir. Uh, so yeah. I don't know how we are doing on time. Yes, sir, so due yeah. to lack of time, we need to yeah. end yeah. the question and answers right now. Thank you, sir, for such an informative and delightful session. I would like to request Dr. Ketan Koteja to share his thoughts on his given session. Please, sir. Let me sit over there so I can see you. <laughs> so. so I think I have exactly two minutes. Uh, first of all, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks, Dr. Pant, for a uh, very you know, enlightening session. And particularly, I like uh, being an engineer because I think we, uh, only two people are engineers in the entire crowd today, <laughs> excepting the fact that AI won't replace the doctors because otherwise engineers keep on claiming <laughs> that they will replace the doctors. Uh, but at the same time, I would like to add to that that the doctors like him who is, at, uh, who is using AI will definitely compete more with the others, those who are not using. So definitely have a tie up, uh, learn something AI as well, so that I think you will do better. <clears throat> uh, important thing also he told about bias, uh, which AI is having because it's always, AI works in a very limited domain. In generalized way, it never works, and it means common sense is missing. Uh, which is very uncommon, but it is very much missing in AI algorithms, and that's what uh, AI will never uh, again uh, replace the uh, doctors. So the opportunities are there. Uh, I would say uh, ample of opportunities, particularly in our country where number of doctors required are very huge in number compared to available. According to the one of the report I was reading, it is half right now compared to what is expected. And co population is growing exponentially, so that growth uh, is to be matched. In that scenario, I think Mary with uh, engineers like us who know AI will be definitely helpful. And that's the goal of Symbiosis as well, where um, you know here Engineering Institute and Medical Institute is in close vicinity where uh, we would like that uh, we learn something from healthcare and we try to we apply AI in that. So with that, I'll conclude, but um, one more thing, uh, which is also a negative, uh, if you trust AI and AI algorithm for diagnosis and all, um, which I can tell my personal experience, when I was admitted in the same hospital for a, as a COVID patient, um, I think 50% was 50% uh, recovery was because of I think Dr. Nataraj and Dr. Atra. Once they visited me and told me that you are eating well, you are sleeping well, uh, physically are okay, nothing to worry. So that was a 50% cure, and that AI will never reach to. Thank you, thank you very much. Now I request Dr. Ketan Kotecha to felicitate Mr. Anuradha Pant. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for such a delightful session.